Uh, hi, good morning everybody. I hope I'm not speaking too loud for anyone, but I think we're going to get right into this and we'll, wait, we'll wake everybody up if you're not already awake. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about JRuby, what it's going to look, what it's been like working on it in the past, what we're trying to do with it, and where we're going in the future. Uh, basic details about me. Uh, working at Red Hat now for the past three years, full time on JRuby, spending all my time trying to make the best Ruby possible on the JVM. Uh, I am from the other side of the world. Uh, I live in Minneapolis in northern United States, uh, where it's now anywhere from freezing or down as far as the temperature goes. So it's nice to be here in a little bit warmer climate. Uh, it's a beautiful place in the summer, and actually it's a pretty beautiful place in the winter too, uh, at least for about a month. And then we start to get kind of sick of it, and that's when I leave and start going to conferences. Uh, but while I'm there, and while it's cold and unpleasant during the winter, I have lots of time to work on JRuby. How many folks are using JRuby for something today? All right, cool, this is a prime audience here. Uh, so. Ruby, JRuby is of course Ruby on the JVM, or uh, you can reverse that and say it's the JVM for Ruby. We're bringing the best parts of the JVM uh, to Ruby. And unfortunately this has a lot of other thing, a lot of other meanings to people. People hear Ruby and they see the J in the JRuby name and they start to have other thoughts about what this actually is going to mean for them. Uh, and then start to say, okay, well, this is not something for me. I'm not a Java person. Why would I ever want to use JRuby? It's really not my thing, you know? Uh, but, you know, honestly, let's, let's get down to brass tacks here. This is just Ruby. It's a Ruby implementation. We are co-opting the JVM so that we get all the benefits of that platform, but still have the language we want to use. And as much as possible, we've tried to make JRuby feel and act just like a standard Ruby implementation. So ideally, you'll never have to really think about the fact that you're running on the JVM, on the Java platform. Current release, current stable release is JRuby 1.7.19. Uh, and the 19 is important there. We are continuing to maintain this and, and keep this stable version long into the future. Uh, and we've decided that even after we release the next major version of JRuby, we're probably going to continue with updates and patch releases for at least a year on this one. Uh, we know that folks don't necessarily want to be forced to upgrade. Uh, JRuby 1.7 is 1.8 and 1.9 compatible. Uh, 193-ish. Uh, it has this AST interpreter. We've got a JVM bytecode JIT. Generally faster than C Ruby. Uh, usually the fastest Ruby implementation out there that you you can have right now. Uh, and there's more work that we're doing in the future to make that even better. Uh, probably the biggest feature that's interesting about JRuby, other than the just mechanical details of running faster and having real threads. Uh, easy integration with all the other JVM languages and libraries out there. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We do not support MRIC extensions. Uh, this has been a bit of an issue in the past because there's a lot of libraries people depend on, but more and more we've got JRuby, JVM versions of those libraries, and, or those library authors are willing to work with us to provide a JRuby version. So it's less and less of a problem over time. Now, a lot of folks don't know JRuby is actually a pretty old project. Uh, this is the first commit by Jan Arne Peterson in 2001. Uh, I have never met the guy. I've never had the opportunity. I believe he exists because there's evidence to indicate that he does exist, uh, but he is no longer involved with the project. Uh, I came to it in about 2005 or so and started working on it, and at that point, none of the original people were still involved with it. As open source does, it's been handed off to many people over the years. Uh, and over those years, we've had hundreds of contributors. Uh, this is out of our Git repository. We've had all sorts of folks. Chad Fowler's on here. Uh, Tom Annabo, the other JRuby guy, is apparently on here four times. So he's really, really excited about contributing to JRuby. He uses many different pseudonyms. Uh, but if your name isn't up here, we'd love to see it here. Any sort of small patch, it, even documentation changes. We love to get people in the community to help out. Uh, we're really we're here because of folks like you contributing to us over the years. 
And now on the other half of that, the people, there's people that contribute to it, and there's also lots of people that use it. Uh, at RubyConf this past year, I sent out a tweet uh, about two days before we were gonna give our talk, asking, so is there anybody out there that uses JRuby that might like their company's logo on a slide? And I got hundreds of responses. I could not believe it. I thought I might have a couple dozen folks, but I never hear about most of these people because it's working so well for them, they don't have to contact us. They put JRuby into production, they run large scale applications, some of these mission critical applications, and we never hear from them. But they're out there, it's running a lot of key stuff. Uh, one of the more exciting ones for me, uh, BBC News here, all of the UK election results that are displayed on their site, that's a JRuby app. So we were, we were there for the, uh, the Scottish referendum, uh, we were there for all the recent elections as well. Uh, but it's, you know, it's exciting to see this. Everyone uh, keeps telling me, yeah, you guys should start a company or something. But I mean, it's really cool to have these people using it and it makes me feel good about the work that we've done. So why did we want to do this? Why have we spent eight years working full time trying to make JRuby better and better? Uh, well, the truth is that Ruby is not quite perfect. There are things that Ruby is just not the right, right tool for. And what we're trying to do is make Ruby the right tool for more jobs. Up until the uh, advent of V8 and the other fast JavaScript engines, JavaScript was the redheaded stepchild of the language family. Nobody liked JavaScript then, and nobody really likes JavaScript now, but <laughs> until it turned out that JavaScript could actually be made to run fast, I mean, you know, C fast, nobody wanted to use it. Now look at it, JavaScript is everywhere. Simply making a better runtime, making Ruby run as fast as C, or even as fast as JavaScript on V8, could be a complete game changer for where the Ruby world goes. And that's what we're trying to do right now. So to that end, lots of work. I mentioned that I started in about 2005 or 2006, uh, and around that time, a bunch of other contributors started to get involved too. Rails was obviously a big driver here. We thought maybe we could get Rails to run on the JVM, get it to be able to deploy on standard JVM servers with, with regular Java applications. Uh, we managed to do that. And over the years, we've managed to keep compatibility improving. We've managed to catch up with CRuby and get all the features going. And then this big spike towards the end is the work on JRuby 9000, the new major version. Most work that we've ever done on any release of JRuby uh, Ruby 2.2 compatible, finally catching up on compatibility. We've got a new runtime and compiler that allows us to do a lot better job optimizing, analyzing code, getting closer and closer to actually see speeds for Ruby. Uh, we've reworked a whole bunch of the lower level subsystems so they match MRI better, new I.O. subsystem, new process management, all of the stuff that was little, little things that we couldn't fix in the old versions of JRuby, we've fixed now. We really believe that this is finally our chance to catch up and be on par feature-wise with MRI and start going into the future as far, as far as performance. So 9000 Pre-1 is out there, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in each of the areas coming up about where we're going with it and what we think is gonna happen in the next year. So what are the challenges of implementing Ruby or making Ruby better, making it ready for all the future of development, future applications? Uh, these are the five areas I'm going to walk through real quick and talk about what we're doing to try and improve these situations and what we're going to do in the future. So first of all, concurrency. Um, we've heard a little bit about it from other talks here. Uh, you all kind of know the general situation as far as CRuby. Uh, we did manage to get into real native threads, so blocking calls and things like that usually don't block the entire runtime. Uh, but we've still got this lock that keeps us from using multiple cores at once. That's largely because the internals of MRI, the internals of CRuby, just aren't designed to have multiple threads working on them at the same time. Uh, anybody who's ever tried to do concurrency in C will know what that challenge is, and it's a very large code base of C that was never designed for, for multi-core. So as a result, what you have with MRI, if you want to run 10-way uh, concurrency on your 200 gig Rails app or other kind of application, uh, well, you're going to need 10 instances, basically. Uh, so 10 instances times 200 meg application, that's two gigabytes of memory you're consuming. Now as your application scales up, you can imagine this just gets worse and worse. You want to do 100-way concurrency, have 100 user requests at the same time, we're talking about 20 gig of memory. And this starts to get into real money, especially if running, running on a virtualized server. Uh, we heard recently from someone that ran a large Ruby application on CRuby on EC2, took the whole thing from, J Ruby, from, from C Ruby to JRuby and dropped it from something like 20 extra large instances down to five mediums or something. I mean, this is tens of thousands of dollars a month that you save by not having to scale 
with multiple processes and with these giant memory spaces. And that's because multi-core in JRuby looks basically like this. Here's your 10-way concurrency. Here's your 100-way concurrency. We're going to have a little bit more base memory usage, but if you need any more than one or two instances on your machine, or on your server, it's probably going to pay off very quickly when you're in JRuby. And you can go all the way up to 1,000. We've had people saturate an entire machine with a 200 or 300 megabyte JRuby application. 16 ways, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, so the goal is that we need to be able to bring Ruby applications from looking like this when you're, when you're hitting them hard to this. And so this is one JRuby process. You can hit it with as many threads as you want, and it'll scale out to all the available cores in the system. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into this, because there's lots of other good presentations out there about how to do concurrency well, what the perils are, what the libraries are. Um, there's one that I've been doing at a couple of different conferences. There's videos out there bringing concurrency to Ruby, walks through some of these libraries, walks through some patterns to watch out for. Uh, I will talk, however, about some future work that we want to do here. So first of all, with talks like that, with conferences like this, uh, I'm trying to get out and just educate people a little bit more about what concurrency looks like in Ruby. Uh, what are those libraries? What are things that we can do to write better concurrent applications? Uh, helping libraries make sure they know how to write good thread-safe code, what to avoid and what, what, to use, uh, uh, what, to, what to use as far as utilities out there. Uh, one of the biggest libraries, the most important pieces of work in Ruby right now is the concurrent Ruby gem. Uh, this is under the Ruby Concurrency Organization on GitHub. Uh, but dozens of folks have been contributing to this. It has just about every concurrency pattern you can think of. Futures, promises, uh, thread-safe collections, atomic updates, uh, thread pools. It's all in one, one utility, one library. You install this and you get all of that for free. Uh, it has no C extension dependency unless you want a little bit more uh, performance out of some of, those, some of those areas, like the atomic references but it's the way that most people are going to be doing concurrent Ruby applications in the future. So take a look at that. Uh, we want to leverage better tools. There's all sorts of analysis tools and can code flow tools and whatnot for the JVM that we should be able to leverage in Ruby too, to be able to see how data structures are being used across threads, whether they're getting mutated, what the likelihood of having a race on some piece of data is. We can do more of that in the future as we get uh, our new runtime, as we get better integration with these tools. Uh, JVM support is also improving. Uh, one of the big projects for Java 9 and beyond is to have automatic vectorization. Uh, we heard yesterday from Brendan about vectoriz vectorizing problems, where you've got uh, a uniform data set that you want to perform trans some, sor some sort of transformation on. Uh, there's actually work now in the project Sumatra to make that happen automatically at the JVM level. So you could see that in a year's time or a year and a half, you'd be able to throw a giant data set into Ruby pass it a block to execute, and the JVM will automatically take that and run it across multiple cores, potentially over hundreds of cores if it's on a GPU. These are the sort of things that are coming up for us that we get for free by being on this platform. Uh, OK, so next section, talking about language and libraries here. So in MRI, you have two choices if you want to implement some functionality. You can write it in Ruby, which is what we usually prefer to do. I think most of us do anyway. Uh, or you can write it in C. And that's pretty much it. And of course, by C, I mean there's various native languages that you can hook into Ruby. Uh, but otherwise, you're pretty much talking about the Ruby world and then this native ball of crap below it. Uh, in JRuby, on the other hand, you can use Ruby. You can use Java, of course. You can use some of the, the new hot languages like Scala or Clojure, if you want. Uh, you can use JavaScript. There's multiple JavaScript implementations, all integrated nice and in the same memory space. Uh, you can use microfocus visual COBOL if you really need to. Uh, but the, the, the point is that there's dozens of languages out there, all sorts of languages with their own libraries, their own ecosystems, their own way of looking at problems, and they're all available to you when you're running with JRuby. <coughs> uh, we even go beyond that, and we've been maintaining the FFI gem and trying to find easier ways to integrate with native code. So not only can you use all the JVM languages, you can still use all those native languages if you want. You can call into C libraries uh, and use them as though they were regular Ruby code. So a lot of people ask about the C extension thing. That's a, a big issue for some folks. In JRuby 1.6, we did support C extensions. Uh, it was a Google Summer of Code project, and uh, we, we did a pretty decent job, or, or our student did a pretty decent job. Just grab this. Uh, our student did a very good job of implementing uh, 
everything that we needed for basic C extension support, and we were able to get it largely functional. There were a lot of small libraries that did build, did load, and work on JRuby. Uh, the problem, unfortunately, is that it never ended up fitting into the JVM very well. Uh, the JVM protects its memory space very aggressively, uh, whereas MRI exposes raw pointers, raw access into the heap. Uh, the JVM has various threading requirements. You've got to explicitly pass control in and out of the native code. MRI, it's all just one happy world where C code and Ruby code are running right next to each other. Uh, so largely, this never worked as well as we liked. And we just kept getting reports about how it didn't do what it needed to do. So we moved that out. It's no longer supported in JRuby. If you're really interested in this, the code is there, and we'd be happy to, to let you support it. Um, I want to kind of cover these. So then, what are the alternatives that we have uh, for using C extensions in JRuby? Well, like I mentioned, we've got all these other languages out there. Uh, you can use any one of them. Uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the C extensions that have been out there have just been straight line-by-line -line ports into a piece of Java code. It's usually pretty easy to get the support we need for the same libraries. Uh, we can call out to Java libraries without doing anything magic. Any library that's available, you can just basically import into the Ruby code, start calling it as if it was regular Ruby classes. So if you want to call out to a graphics library that's not available because the C extension is missing, well, there's a ton of graphics libraries on the JVM. You don't have to write a line of Java code. Just say what you want to use and call it from Ruby. Uh, we do all the type conversion and magic for you. Here's an example of using the Swing GUI library, the one that's built into the JVM. Uh, I'm not going to walk through all this, but you can see there's a few little niceties here. Uh, like the default close operation here is actually set default close operation. Uh, the vis visible equals true at the bottom is actually set visible. We do a lot to try and make these JVM libraries look like their regular Ruby code, uh, even to the point where you can pass in a closure if it needs an interface implementation, things along those lines that just make it fit with the whole flow of the application. So that's the first thing, be able to just use all these libraries directly from Ruby code. Uh, the second one, if you want to go a little bit deeper, you can write the equivalent of a C extension for JRuby uh, using our own Java APIs. Uh, so this is a little bit more complicated than calling out to a simple library, but it gets you good integration the same way that a C extension would for, for Ruby. Uh, now the important thing about mu using multiple languages, calling out to a JRuby extension, that this is the same memory space, the same GC, uh, you can actually track what that library is allocating in memory. You can see what it's doing on the, J on the JVM stack. Stuff that's almost impossible to see in the C code, uh, you can actually track because it's all just part of the same VM and the same heap. Uh, here's an example. This is the each method from our Ruby array class. Uh, and, you know, it's, it looks very similar to what you would write if you were going to write the C extension in Ruby. Uh, we've got a block that's passed in. We check if that block was actually uh, one that came from the user, if it's a given block. If not, we turn it into a numerator. Otherwise, iterate over all the elements, tell the block to yield them out, and that's all there is to it. So it's not really that bad a code. Uh, and actually, in a lot of cases, it's simpler and cleaner than the C extension code would be. And so the final area, if it's not something that you can run on top of the JVM or the library's only native library, you can call out with FFI. Uh, import the library, tell it where to find these function bindings, what the structure layout is, uh, and then make the calls as though they were normal Ruby functions. Uh, this is a medium complicated example, uh, calling the get time of day function in the C library. Uh, here we have a time val structure we create at the top. It takes, it has two unsigned longs uh, for seconds and microseconds. We create our libc module, uh, tell it to load the libc library from the system, and then basically give it the signature, the, the function prototype for get time of day. It takes two pointers and it returns an int. We, down at the bottom, we construct a new instance of our time val struct, pass it to the c function, and we're actually making c calls from Ruby without writing any c code at all. Uh, and I'd like to see, especially for extensions that are mainly just wrapping a library, this is a much easier way to go, a much more compatible way to go than writing a C extension that only works on C Ruby. All right, so futures, where, where are we going to want to go with this? Uh, so I mentioned that JRuby 9000, it's in preview right now. We're hoping for a full release in the next month or two, but we're going to maintain compatibility with the current version of C Ruby from now on. It, take, it took us a long time to get there, uh, but going through Ruby 2.1, Ruby 2.2 features, 
there's only a handful of things left that we don't actually have implemented in JRuby. And we're really happy to have finally caught up. So we're just gonna keep it that way. When Ruby 2.3 comes out next Christmas, within a month or two, we're gonna have a JRuby release that supports Ruby 2.3. Not gonna have to worry about lagging behind anymore. Uh, we want to improve our integration with the JVM languages. Currently, there's a little bit more overhead in doing the calls than we'd like. Uh, and because we've got our own model of what an object is, most Java objects have to be wrapped inside a, a transparent wrapper when they come into JRuby. We'll hope to get rid of that, make that integration even better and faster. Uh, and improve the FFI tooling. There's a couple projects out there to automatically generate that FFI file, look through a header, get the whole layout of structures and where all the functions are, and then generate Ruby FFI code. Uh, we need to make those tools better and we need to get them into your hands. All right, performance, my favorite area. So before I go into this, I want to make sure everybody recognizes that CRuby has steadily improved version on version. They, uh, Koichi and the other folks that work on the VM level have been doing an amazing job given the restrictions that they have to work under, largely the C extension API. Uh, Ruby 1.9 uh, was about two to three times faster than Ruby 1.8, and that was Koichi's new VM, the YARV VM that he integrated at that point. Uh, up to Ruby 2.1, where they started working on better uh, performance for calling into C extensions. Again, about two to three times on most of the benchmarks that I run compared to Ruby 1.9. Uh, and in general, Ruby, the C Ruby implementation is one of the fastest interpreted runtimes out there. It's faster than Python, uh, faster than the interpreted JavaScript engines, and so on. So this is not bad. Given what they have to work with and what, they have, what the restrictions are on making root MRI faster, they're doing a very good job of it. And I'm, I'm really impressed with what they've managed to do, especially with the new generational garbage collection stuff, something nobody thought would ever be possible to do with C Ruby. Koichi and the, and, and the other folks working on the GC have managed to figure it out. So don't lose faith in MRI as far as going forward on performance. They're doing a lot of great work. Now the problem though is that it, it's hard. It's extremely hard to make this stuff fast, especially a, a C-based implementation uh, that doesn't have a lot of freedom with how it's designed. And so we're not even close to the speed of compiled or jitted languages out there. Ruby is, is roundly trounced by V8 and Node, for example. Uh, we need to fix that. That's one of the things we're trying to do with JRuby. So JRuby is faster than MRI on average. There are areas where we're, we, we have improvement uh, to, to make. Uh, generally, if you find something where we're significantly slower than CRuby, it's something that we've done wrong or something we haven't taken the time to optimize. Usually, it's not inherent in how we run or how, the J, how the JRuby is implemented. Uh, again, also static improvement for us. And in many areas now, we're starting to approach Java or C speeds. Uh, if you're doing largely object walking, uh, walking a large graph of data, working with strings, things like that, it's not going to be a whole lot different from writing Java code. Uh, where we need to work on some things is numeric performance, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And a lot of this we, we actually get for free. Uh, this is one of our favorite, favorite charts here. Uh, this is the performance of JRuby 1.0 uh, on a particular benchmark over several different Java versions. And the idea here is that if we had stopped working on JRuby in 2007 when we wrote JRuby 1.0, we still would have gotten these performance, performance improvements year on year. The JVM guys continue to push forward and continue to make the JVM faster without us doing anything. Uh, now, of course, we're going to continue to work on this, but when you look at this compared to what, what would happen if the Ruby team stopped working on MRI, well, it's not going to get any faster, obviously, because no one's actually improving the runtime. Uh, but we could have stopped in 2006 or 7, and we still would have eventually been faster than CRuby. So we get that much for free. And now, like I say, of course, we're not standing still either. Uh, this is now holding the JVM steady. This is OpenJDK 8, same benchmark, but different versions of JRuby. Uh, and, you know, various things that have caused us to have large performance improvements. And this trend is going to continue. We've already got reports that JRuby 9000's preview is faster on many things than JRuby 1.7. And we haven't even started yet, as far as optimization goes. So, good aspects of JRuby, as far as performance. Uh, method dispatch, either from Ruby to Ruby or Ruby to some other language on the JVM, generally cheap or free. Uh, considerably cheaper than in CRuby for, mo for most cases. Uh, method activation, which is the cost of actually starting this method up and exiting it when you're done, is also usually cheap or free. 
For simple methods, it should be as fast as making a raw Java call, and then that gets inlined and it may, may be almost zero cost. Uh, the languages that you call out to, uh, all the languages that I talked about before, they all inline together. So the JVM sees this as just one long call stream, lots of different call languages on that stack, but they all fit into the same JVM, they all have the same byte code, they all optimize together. And we actually do see Java code inline into Ruby code, inline into Java code within JRuby. And that, that makes it much easier for the JVM to optimize and do a good job with it. Uh, and then, of course, the shared resources. Having everything running in the same garbage collector, same memory space, uh, we get the benefit of sharing that runtime. Uh, another one of my favorite graphs here. This is a performance graph showing uh, a pure Ruby red-black tree at the very top running on MRI 2.0. And it's not, the performance hasn't changed a whole lot over time. Uh, the C extension, and this is the, the siren song of C extensions on MRI. Uh, if you can write a little bit of C code and get a 10 times improvement, well, kind of, if you have to have the performance, you have to write something. Uh, but what's really interesting is the bottom result. The bottom result is JRuby using the pure Ruby red black tree beating C Ruby with the C extension. And that's largely because of the way the JVM is now optimizing dynamic languages, because of work we've done to optimize JRuby internally. Uh, and this is going to continue to improve over time. We're going to get to the point where we can run that, that uh, pure Ruby red-black tree as, as if you wrote the entire thing, including the benchmark all in C. So the bad things that we have, I've mentioned a couple of these. Uh, there are patterns that we haven't quite optimized yet. Uh, numeric operations still have to allocate an object all the time. We're not using raw primitives at the, at the JVM level or at the, at the native level. Uh, I mentioned uh, we have various wrappers, various indirections that we need. Uh, for example, instance variables. In order to make it growable at runtime, we have to have a separate abstraction, a separate table. We need to do a better job of reducing that. Uh, closure state is expensive, holding all, that, all the uh, variables available on the heap so that we can call them from a, a block somewhere else. Uh, and of course, startup time is something that we're always working to improve. Uh, and we have some plans for, for JV9000 too. So futures as far as performance goes in JRuby. Well, the big thing in JRuby 9000 is completely new runtime and compiler, uh, which we call unimaginatively our, the intermediate representation, the IR runtime. Uh, and what this is basically, a, it's a traditional compiler architecture. Anyone that's taken a compiler's course uh, and learned about a three address form or SSA, that's generally whereabouts we're talking. So it's a, a well understood optimizing compiler technology. We can write our own optimization passes based on how Ruby works. We can do a lot more with this than we could with the standard AST, or if we were to use a, a coarser grained representation like CRuby does. Uh, and th this also provides much closer mapping to JVM operations. So we've got better visibility into how the code flows. We've got a control flow graph. We can see how to optimize the flow of values and types, start specializing code, and get much better performance out of it. Um, not something you need to read, but this is basically an example of taking a piece of Ruby code, turning it into our intermediate representation. So it becomes a flat list of instructions. Uh, what's not shown here is that we also have information about variables that are alive, uh, whether code is dead or not, whether a particular piece of code only sees fixed numbers, and we can optimize it down to raw, long, 64-bit math. Uh, all of that stuff is possible with the new representation. It really was difficult to do with the old runtime. So I mentioned most of the benefits here. Uh, it, definitely a, a lot of opportunity for performance here. We've only started to scratch the surface. It's also made work on the JIT that I have to write much simpler. Uh, most of these operations map down to just a few JVM bytecodes, but then we can do better job optimizing too. Uh, so comparing JRuby 9000 and, and 1.7 as far as just a simple numeric loop, uh, JRuby 1.7 is about here. This is how many times faster it is than CRuby. Uh, so getting into like a 2.5 times faster. Uh, 9,000 without a whole lot of work is already like 3.5 times faster. So just by switching to a runtime that has better visibility into the flow of code, we've already bumped it up a bit. And now what we want to do in the next year, uh, probably post, the, post final, once we get the final release out and start doing this, we want to be able to take code like this, which is obviously just doing a numeric loop, and turn it into whatever that uh, would optimize as. If we can see that this particular piece of code is always receiving a fixed num, a 64-bit long, 
Why don't we just optimize this as if it's all 64-bit long operations at the native level? Nothing, nothing about that has to require Ruby's magic as far as fixed num goes. Now, we've actually done some experiments on this. Uh, early results look pretty good. This is JRuby using an, uh, a pass that turns fixed num math into raw native 64-bit operations. And now we're getting into the neighborhood of 60 times faster than CRuby. And this is actual running code that we've had in the past. Uh, we've also done some uh, performance measurements of Mandelbrot functions uh, with floating point optimization. Uh, again, uh, 40 to 50 times faster than CRuby on that. And this is, this is just the beginning, just the beginning. We're also looking at other languages on the JVM like Nashorn. Nashorn is a newer implementation of JavaScript for the JVM that takes advantage of Invoke Dynamic, the JVM's new dynamic language features, uh, that, that does a lot of work internally to specialize paths that use integers for a particular, particular path, paths that use a floating point for another path, and be able to, tr to use the one that's optimal for the code that's running. They're turning that whole back end into a library. We'll be able to leverage that and say, OK, well, now it's Ruby code. Specialize it for math. Specialize it for these particular data structures, and then go from there. Uh, another library that's doing something similar that I found out just last week, uh, this is one that plugs into our JVM JIT. So we just tell it, OK, here's a variable that might be a fixed num, or it might be something else. Give us two versions of the code so that we can branch from one to the other and get the optimization without having to write that stuff ourselves. Very exciting. Uh, he was showing his little uh, uh, demonstration dynamic scripting language based on this running FIB45 in like five, six seconds. I mean, C speeds for that sort of stuff. And that's the sort of things that we can start plugging into. Now, in the far distant future, uh, some of you might have heard we're working with Oracle Labs on a, a project called Truffle. Uh, so Truffle is basically an optimizing language framework uh, built on top of Graal, a pure Java JIT, a pure Java native compiler. Uh, the idea here is that you write the AST, the interpreter for your language. You put in some hints about, OK, here's where you go if it's going to be an integer. Here's where you go if it's going to be this type of data. Uh, if this array looks like it's all 32-bit uh, ints, let's pack it down and make it a 32-bit array so we can save space and do better vectorization and so on. And then Truffle will go off and create all of the native optimizations for you. And they're showing incredible results. Uh, this is now uh, on the far right. This is JRuby plus Truffle compared to our unboxing. Uh, now, this is very early, very experimental research work, but they literally are getting to the point where they can run C fast as far as Ruby goes. So in the next year or so, you're going to see Ruby on JRuby through one of these mechanisms running as fast as C for many, many things. This is going to happen, and it's very exciting. All right, so moving on to, to something that we really do no work on, but we get a lot of benefit, uh, garbage collection. Uh, so this is a, a graph showing uh, garbage collection in Ruby 2.0. Uh, and as I mentioned, they've made steady improvement. The, the new generational garbage collection stuff is certainly helping in the C Ruby world. Uh, but this, this is a, there's an inflection point here. So the blue is the number of, uh, let's see, the time per GC, yes. The blue is the, the amount of time it takes away from your application based on the size of the heap. Uh, whenever MRI has to do its garbage collection, generally it has to scan all the objects in memory to see which ones are dead. And so the more live objects that you have, the larger the data set, uh, the more problems you're going to have. It's going to take longer to scan all those objects in O of N operation. Uh, on the JVM, uh, the same situation does not happen. Any objects that are old enough that they, that they aren't garbage collected get punted off to a separate memory space and scanned rarely. So only the, the volatile part of your application actually requires full stop the world garbage collection. And so this is a, this, the scale is lost on this graph, but I think this goes all the way up to about a th three or four gigabyte application. And now the, the important thing that I want to point out also is that sometimes CRuby is actually not the wrong choice. If you have an application that's down here in the small end and you don't have that many concurrent requests and you don't have that much data in memory, they may do just fine. I mean, you're not going to have the garbage collection problems that a lot of people talk about. But you will cross that line eventually. Your application is going to get enough users or enough data that garbage collection is going to start being your biggest problem. And that may be a good time to start looking at JRuby. Uh, I, I mentioned that Ruby 2.2 has improved this a lot. They have. That graph is much flatter as far as the total amount of time. 
uh, but it is still spending a great deal of time doing garbage collection. Uh, this is just garbage collection counts per iteration on sort of a garbage collection stressing script that I have. Uh, and, and again, Ruby spending, C Ruby spending a lot more time doing garbage collection. J Ruby pretty much is just a flat line at the bottom. Uh, and, and of course, this, this translates to time. Even though these garbage collections are usually very quick, certainly much quicker in Ruby 2.2 than before, you're doing so many of them, it does add up. Uh, we also have the advantage on the JVM that there's many GCs for different purposes. Uh, Nobody is probably going to use the serial collector, which basically takes all concurrency out of it. But you've got a parallel collector, uses as many cores as there are in your system to reduce the pauses. We've got concurrent collectors that try to run as much as possible while your application continues to work, so you don't see pauses at all. Uh, and then if you want to go all the way to commercial JVMs like Azul Zing, we've got continuously concurrent collectors. Collectors that are guaranteed to never pause your application, regardless of how big it is. And these, this is the JVM that they use on 64 gig, 128 gig, and larger heaps. So gigantic applications, and they still can guarantee no pauses. Uh, so there's all this stuff available for us on the JVM, and then because of that, it's all available to you too. Uh, and now, what this actually looks like, if you were to start running your JRuby application, you might see concurrency out of a single-threaded application. And what you're actually seeing here is that the JVM is being smart about garbage collection. Here's the parallel collector running in the background a little, or, or using as many cores as possible, and the concurrent collector trying to run at the same time as the application. So what this all adds up to is that if you're running on JRuby, it's very, very unlikely that garbage collection is ever going to be your performance problem. Uh, if it is, it's, it's something that we can look into improving in JRuby. It's something algorithmic that's wrong with the application. But for a well-written application, GC is not going to hinder you from building what you want to build. All right, the last area I want to talk about, tooling. Uh, so anybody who's worked with a JVM knows that JVM tools are awesome. This thing's been around for 20 years. People have built every dimension of tools for analyzing heaps and memory, uh, watching what threads are doing. Uh, profiling applications in various ways. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is Visual GC. Uh, it's, part, it's a plugin for Visual VM, a tool that comes standard for free with the OpenJDK. And what this actually is showing, it's a live view of the garbage collector and the heaps that it's operating on, how full they are. Uh, you can see the one that's going up very rapidly there. That's the young space. That's where all the new garbage is created. Garbage that stays, sticks around for a garbage collection run or two goes into one of the survivor spaces on the bottom. Uh, the short brownish bar there is the old generation. That's where all the data that doesn't need to be examined for garbage collection goes. You can take tools like this, and this is just a free one. There's even more amazing ones that are you know, for, for pay, but lots of free tools like this that give you a view into what your application is doing. You can see it actually working live and figure out where in your application you need to improve. Uh, we've also taken advantage of some of these tools in JRuby. So if you pass the dash dash manage flag to JRuby, uh, it will turn on some management hooks at the JVM level. Uh, you can connect up with Visual VM or with JConsole to what's called JMX, Java Management Extensions. Uh, here we're, we've got some graphs of the JVM's collection counts over time uh, and just built into the tool. We even expose some internal JRuby metrics. So here we have a, a parser stats. Uh, metric that we expose through this tool. You can see whether you're doing a lot of evals over time. Uh, maybe you're seeing some performance problems. You can go in there and see, OK, why am I running eval every single time I do a request? That's something to look into. Uh, and, and much more. There's more that we can add here. Uh, and you can actually access all this stuff from Ruby, too. This is using the JMX library, uh, a library for JRuby as, that, that can be both a client and a server for JMX. Here, we're monitoring the same things. We're going and getting the memory endpoint in JMX, getting GC information out of it, and then we can report it. Uh, if you look, there's a, a JRuby dashing project that we have under the JRuby organization. It's using the dashing dashboard with JMX to provide a nice dashboard of JVM metrics. And now, maybe these aren't the right metrics for you. JMX gem also supports defining your own. Anywhere in your application you want to publish a metric to one of these servers to make it available for a graph or for analysis, you can write a little bit of Ruby code and expose it very easily. Uh, request times, uh, how long that SQL requests are taking, what the most recent SQL requests have been structured like, and so on. Easy for you to put these endpoints out there and then use any of the available tools to go and monitor. 
Uh, there's also JVM support for doing heap dumps. So we heard about you know, memory leaks, uh, trying to find problematic code. Where are these objects coming from? Why are they leaking? Uh, there's lots of tools for doing heap dumps and analysis on the JVM. Visual VM has some built into it. There's some command line tools like JMAP and JHAT. Uh, now, this is also kind of useful to us within JRuby. We can see how many Ruby strings are being created. We can look at our own implementations and see if we're, we're wasting memory or leaking memory. Uh, it's, this particular tool may or may not be as useful to you. Uh, if we dig down into the contents of the string, there's a byte list that basically represents the byte array. Uh, and then we go to the byte array and, oh, well, that's not particularly useful. I don't know what string that is anymore. Uh, but we can see that the bytes are there, and we can translate these into what the actual string content would be. But this sort of thing is where we get into some future work that we're doing on tooling. Uh, so the first thing is trying to make these heap dumps a little bit more useful for Rubyists. Tom and about the other JRuby guys have been working on a project called Alienist, which takes a JVM heap dump and translates it, knowing what we know about Ruby, into a Ruby heap dump as uh, just JSON, basically. So we get our JSON heap dump out of there that actually says this is a string, this is a, uh, a Ruby Gems version specification, so on. Uh, now we can take that dump and actually turn it into, use it with other tools. Alienist Viewer is a simple application. I don't know if it's actually a Rails app anymore, but it's a little web application that can look at that heap dump, tell you where all the objects are in memory, what the histogram looks like, uh, and with a little bit more work, we could even say where these objects are allocated. You've got 5,000 strings that you've leaked. We can tell you exactly where in your code they were allocated and what you need to do to fix it. We also want to have more met metrics. Uh, if there are things about JRuby or Ruby execution or the JVM itself that you feel we should expose, let us know. It's very easy for us to add those to the standard metrics. Also very easy for you to just write some Ruby code and expose them yourself. Uh, most of the monitoring services like New Relic do have JMX support. So by adding these features, you're going to be able to get free monitoring in those, tool, in those services and tools for whatever metrics you want to expose. Uh, remote debugging and profiling already kind of work, but we want to do remote debugging and profiling that's a bit more Ruby aware. Rather than showing you a JVM stack, let you do some remote debugging of Ruby code, remote profiling of Ruby code, and, and get the information you're actually interested in. This is an example of using Alienist. Uh, so we've got a little program that basically just starts up and sits there. Uh, we do use JMAP, the command line JVM tool, to get a JVM memory dump, uh, and then run Alienist against that dump to turn it into a Ruby output. That output looks like this. There's more information that could go in here. This is what was useful for uh, traversing the graph, walking objects in memory. Uh, but you can see that you could write any tools you want. If you want to go in there and write your own queries against this data, uh, there's lots of stuff in there. And the entire heap is laid out with references. Uh, you can find anything you need. Up here at the top, the class name actually reflects the Ruby class name rather than whatever our internal J JVM object is. We've got IDs that you can use to track every single object through the system. So you know where a string is going. And you can follow it through the whole system and figure out why it isn't doing what it's supposed to. Uh, and then, of course, the viewer, again, looks very similar to that J hat, the, uh, the JVM tool. Uh, but we're actually getting Ruby instance information out of this. And we've got Ruby instance variables rather than our internal structure. So this is working today. There's more we can do, but we want to make it a useful tool for everybody. Uh, and I mentioned the histograms. You can actually get histograms of all the JV, all the Ruby objects in memory, too. So to-dos here, uh, being able to track the actual size of objects, that's available, but it's not in the tool right now. Uh, we can use query language, like object query language, uh, to make it a little easier to traverse that whole graph. We want to make someone do the same dumper for MRI. It's possible to get an in-memory dump of all of the objects in CRuby, uh, but it's not in a common format. We could share the same JSON format and share the tools that are built around it. We really want to work with Ruby Core to have some shared tools. Uh, we'd like to have some, some flexibility to have implementation-specific data in some cases. Uh, right now, it's trying to be more general as much as possible. Uh, and then you know, making this format common, so we have a common specification across implementations uh, so we can all benefit from the same tools, trying to make this a, a better world, a world for all of us. So now it's your turn. Uh, there were only about five or six hands that went up as far as people that are using JRuby for something today. We'd really like to have you try something out and let us know how it goes. If there's anything keeping you from doing it, let me know personally.
and I'll see what I can do to, to make it easier for you. And we also want more folks contributing. This is JRuby over the last month. Uh, 790 commits on master, 909 commits. So there's, there's our hundred and some going into Ruby one, or JRuby 1.7 maintenance. Uh, we've had 24 different people commit, uh, uh, commit changes to JRuby, and this is consistently growing over time. Uh, of all of the Ruby implementations, this is by far the most activity. Uh, even, even C Ruby leading up to the 2.2 release did not have this many commits going in in a given month. And this is where we really need you to get involved. We want more people. We want to keep this momentum. There's a lot of exciting work going on in JRuby in the next year. So check it out, jruby.org. You can download a, a package. You really don't have to build anything. You unpack it, sit, put it in path, and you've got JRuby available with the only prerequisite that there's a JVM installed somewhere on your system. Uh, if you use any of the Ruby installers, JRuby-9000 should work. Uh, if you want the most current head version, JRuby head works as well for RVM and, and so on. Um, if, if neither of those works in a given installer, the actual version number is 9.0.0.0, and that usually should get you there. Uh, if you're running anything on Travis, JRuby head will actually get our latest green build of master. It only updates when it's green, so you know that you're going to have something that we expect to be able to run your code. So throw that into your Travis configs, and you'll be able to make sure that we're running well, and call us out if we break something, because we really want to know when we do that. And of course, if you find any issues, contact me directly, file bugs online, whatever. Don't, don't shout into the wind and say, JRuby sucks on Twitter, and then walk away. Let me know, because I really want to try and fix it. I want to make it a better tool for all of you. Uh, and this, this is our tool. This is not just my project. It's not just for me. This is for everybody out here. So come over to the project, give it a try, help us build Ruby's future into something that we, we can be proud of and that we can go to other language communities and say, we can do everything that you can do. Thank you. And I think we got time for questions. We go until 10, yeah? Right, in the back. So the question is, is there a difference between OpenJDK and Oracle JDK? Um, only minor differences. Uh, the Oracle JDK has a few commercial features in it. Uh, some of the mon there's some additional monitoring tools, which are actually free for development and really cool. But only minor differences. Uh, OpenJDK is Oracle JDK for pretty much everything that you're going to care about. Anything else? Oh, yes. 9,000? 9,000, yes. We used to have a series of slides explaining why we chose 9,000. Uh, the first reason was that we realized that the next major version of JRuby would be 1.8. And that would start to get a little confusing, because we'd say, OK, JRuby 1.8 supports Ruby 2.2. Uh, JRuby 1.9 supports Ruby 2.3. It just starts to get very confusing as far as what version it actually is. So we just said, screw it, 9,000. Why not? Uh, and it just kind of became a code name for a long time. But it kind of stuck. People seemed to like it. Uh, there was obviously, you know, we were really excited about doing our first maintenance release of JRuby 9,000, because then we can say that JRuby is finally over 9,000. Uh, uh, a lot of people have you know, drawn references to HAL 9000. We don't really like that one as much. But, uh, but you know, we, we did backtrack a little bit. It's actually version 9, essentially. Uh, I actually did a little experiment. I, I went back through all of our major JRuby releases, and it turns out that this will actually be the ninth major JRuby release. So just serendipitously, it turns out that JRuby 9 is actually a pretty good version number, uh, and it's kind of fun, too. Yeah. Right, so like I mentioned, the question is about no Gabiri since it depends on C. Um, like I mentioned, most of the, the, the authors of C extension libraries on, uh, for Ruby now recognize that JRuby is very important, and usually they, they are working on a JRuby version at the same time. Uh, for Nokogiri, we had a number of folks, and still have folks, that are working with the Nokogiri team to continue to support JRuby. There is a JRuby version of it with all the C stuff replaced with Java libraries and, and Java code. Works great out of the box. There's lots of folks in production with Nokogiri on JRuby. Um, same thing for JSON, same thing for Psyche, same thing for most of the key C extensions that you're going to be using. 
Uh, if you find one that there isn't a JRuby version of it, let us know. Sometimes the author will be willing to work with us. Sometimes I'll tweet, and the next day someone will have one. It's, it, Right. Right. So it's it, it's a it's a just another platform for the Nokogiri gem. So the same dependency. Once you're on JRuby, it's going to go and look for the Java version of Nokogiri. So Rails for sure. You install if you have Rails in your gem file and you're building a Rails app, it's going to work on JRuby out of the box just fine. Uh, most libraries out there are going to work fine. It's, it's usually going to be just one-off cases, like if you decided to start using the OJ JSON parser for, for, uh, for Ruby. Uh, we don't have a C extension version of that right now, but I got an email last week from the OJ maintainer. He's working on one. Stuff like that. So we really just need to know what those key extensions are, the key libraries we don't support, so that we can get it out there for people. Anything else? All right, great. Well, I'm going to be around uh, for the event tonight. I'll be in and out a little bit today, kind of getting over a cold. But uh, give it a try. I mean, we really just want this to be useful for you guys. We wouldn't be doing it if there weren't that list of companies that have built their entire platforms on top of JRuby. So have fun, and thanks a lot.